Hello, and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace event today, countering the coups in the Greater Sahel. I am Joseph Sani, Vice President of USIP Africa Center. For those of you who may be new to USIP, we are a national nonpartisan independent institute founded by the US Congress. We are dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible and essential for US global security. Like many of you, we at USRP have been tracking closely the coup d'etat in the Greater Sahel region as the rise in military rule puts an already fragile region in greater risk of generalized instability. Army officers have seized power in Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Sudan, and Chad. Coup makers have taken advantage of weak governments struggling to provide basic services in expansive countries. This is due to underlying factors made worse by stressors such as COVID-19, climate change, and violent extremism. Poor security and weak governance are major problems. Despite international support, governments in the Greater Sahel have largely failed to tackle the rise of armed groups, which have led to great human suffering. Despite these feelings, though, popular support for democracy remains strong in the region and throughout Africa. That is certainly the case in Sudan, where there have been popular uprisings since the coup. At the Africa Center, we recognize that each country is different, but they are common drivers of instability. Today, we will hear from our distinguished panel some policy recommendations to address instability and reverse this worrisome trend of coups. We are delighted that Ambassador Kamisa Kamara will learn her expertise in navigating this timely conversation. Kamisa is a senior visiting expert for the Sahel here at USIP and has served as Mali's foreign minister, among other high-level positions. Kamisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunny, for setting the scene. I am delighted to be joined by such esteemed panelists to think, to think through possible and practical options for responding to the coups we've observed in the Greater Sahel. I will start by introduce, introducing the discussants. Um, Vamba Dizodele, uh, good morning and welcome. Um, Vamba is a senior fellow and director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. He's also a lecturer in African studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Cameron Hudson uh, is a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. He previously served as the senior strategic advisor at the United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum. Thank you so much for joining us, Cameron. Joshua Miservi is the Senior Policy Analyst for Africa and the Middle East at the Heritage Foundation, where he focuses on geopolitics, counterterrorism, and refugee policy. And last but not least, Dr. Joe Siegel leads the research program at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, where he produces excellent region products with the aim of generating policy relevant analysis that contribute to addressing Africa's security challenges. At this point, I would like to invite the audience to join the conversation we're about to have with the hashtag countering coups on social media or posing questions for the panel directly in the chat box on the event webpage. We'll turn the discussion towards those questions for the final portion of the conversation. But first, I would like to kick us off with a question for all panelists. What are ways the international community can become more constru constructively engaged in response 
to the coups. We've had many coups over the past uh, couple of years, and there have been questions about what the international community can do, what their responses have been, what their responses could have been. Cameron, how about you start? Uh, well, thanks, Camissa, and thanks uh, to USIP for, for this conversation and for all the great work that uh, that you've been doing uh, over the course of the months as these as these coups have um, you know unfolded. I think that one thing that we have to to think about just to start this conversation is when we talk about what should we do, I think maybe a better way to pose that question is what shouldn't we be doing? Um, and part of what we shouldn't maybe be doing is what we have been doing, right? I think that um, what strikes me when I look back at um, at the course of the last six months or year that we've seen these these coups emerge, um, and frankly, the, the storm clouds were, were, were on the horizon, you know, well before that, um, you haven't seen a great uh, pivot in international policy towards the Sahel region in either response to these coups or um, as the sort of storm clouds were gathering. And I think that we, uh, as part of the international community, but certainly as sort of the Western, you know, a leader of the Western Security Alliance that has been, um, you know, very heavily engaged, literally with boots on the ground um, across this region for, for the better part of the past decade, we really need to rethink our own approach to this, um, you know, looking beyond the kind of uh, local drivers of conflict, which I know we'll talk about, I think we in the West have to, um, you know, turn the gaze on ourselves a bit and, and, and really uh, interrogate the role that our security approach, our security relationships have played, and I think um, undermining uh, both civilian rule across the region, but also I think uh, playing into what has emerged as a very kind of dysfunctional power dynamic uh, across the region, where you have, um, you know, France, the United States, uh, and other European partners essentially uh, going in and pursuing a set of very hard strategic interests, which I don't think are particularly well balanced with the values that we espouse uh, related to uh, democracy and civilian rule. And I know we, you know, we often talk about this kind of value values and interests uh, you know, argument and, 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 and tug of war, but I think you're really seeing it play out across the region um, in, in, in fairly dangerous ways. And I think we're now starting to see some of the kind of second order and third order effects of that, this sort of rising anti-Western sentiment, certainly rising anti-French sentiment across the region, um, you know, anti-state sentiment, uh, whereby the security partners that we have been uh, engaging with are themselves in many cases uh, the worst violators of uh, civilian rights and the worst, um, you know, commit committers of, of atrocities in, in the region, even more in some cases than, than the jihadist groups that we're claiming to combat. And so I think we have to really look hard at ourselves at how, do, how can we better balance our, uh, you know, very real and very legitimate security concerns and strategic concerns in the region um, with the kind of the values approach to supporting democratic rule, supporting state institutions, um, and, and how can we better, I think, rebalance our relationships so that we are not putting uh, so much in the uh, you know, in the basket of security services. I think there's just two data points that I would make very clearly. One is we have General Hameti in Sudan going to Russia today in the midst of a huge crisis, you know, mm -hmm. reaching out uh, to Russia um, at a moment when Russia is commanding the attention on the world stage. Um, and then secondly, we have Operation Flintlock going, up, going on across the continent right now, getting lots of media attention. It's our biggest uh, you know, military security operation on the continent annually. Um, and it just strikes me that we never talk about the, the, the work that we're trying to do uh, to build democracies and to build sustainable institutions in the same way that we talk about the military partnerships that we have. And I think that has to change. That's a good point. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh, any thoughts? Yeah, thank you, and and I'll echo uh, Cameron's thanks to to you, Kamisa, and and to uh, Dr. Sani and and USIP, uh, both for uh, hosting this panel, but also the work you've you've been doing on the coups. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, I'll make maybe a few obvious points right at the very beginning here. One, these are these are hugely complex issues, and I think we need to be very careful about uh, trying to reduce them to a few uh, causal factors. Uh, you know, you could probably, if we all sat down, we could probably come up with a hundred different reasons why these things have happened, and some of them are unique to each situation. Um, <clears throat> We also need to have some humility, I think, about what the U.S. can actually accomplish in some of these areas. Um, you know, every time there's a coup, uh, there is a lot of introspection as well there should be, and I totally endorse Cameron's comments about taking a much harder look at how we do security assistance, for instance, and ensure um, that we are not creating a uh, very competent uh, uh, branch of of, um, of the military, while the civilian elements do not keep pace. Uh, the civilian elements should be at least as competent as as uh, the military components. Um, but uh, my analysis of this is that coups are a um, a symptom of a problem. Coups are a symptom of bad governance. And I, I really think that's what so many of these problems boil down to. Um, and the, the harsh reality here is that the West has not figured out yet, uh, or anyone else has figured out yet, how to effectively build legitimate institutions in some of these countries. And, and I would argue it's something we can't do anyways. It's at the very best we can come alongside uh, partners on the ground who are involved in this work. And, and that would be uh, maybe my first recommendation here is that as we approach this problem, our laser focus must be on local actors who have some legitimacy themselves, who are fighting the good fight. There's a lot of, of brave people fighting for better governance and, and democracy and, and everything else in some of these countries. That's really where we should be focused um, and coming alongside them and not trying to impose some sort of, of uh, blueprint for governance uh, that you know might have worked elsewhere, but is not necessarily appropriate uh, to the exact conditions in those places. This is not a defense of, of uh, uh, you know, we, we should absolutely be promoting democracy. That's not what I'm saying. But the idea that in some of these places, a very strong central government is the right form of government, I, I'm not sure that's true, actually. Think of think about Mali and, and just the sheer physical distance between Bamako and, and the north, where, where some of these problems are, you know, sort of festered for so many years and then spread south. Um, I think the U.S. needs to be, think more creatively about more highly federalized systems where you devolve power to local constituencies. Again, this goes back to my point about coming alongside local actors who are working really hard to, um, you know, to to deliver governance that is legitimate and, and brings a certain level of security uh, to to local people. Um, again, very difficult to do and would require sort of a. a a shift, I think, in, in how we view some of these situations, because when we tackle governance problems, uh, at least the U.S. always comes at it from, well, we're going to go through the central government, we need to figure out a way to strengthen the central government, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes that's totally appropriate. But other times, uh, it's, it's unclear to me if that's really where we should be putting all of our focus and energy. And maybe we should be thinking more about, okay, how do we empower local actors who have some legitimacy with their people already? Um, Cameron made, made the excellent point. Some of these militaries we talk about are just as feared, if not more feared than, than some of the terrorist organizations. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we need to, if, if we put all of our eggs in that basket, um, we, we may just be starting off on the back foot from the very beginning. Uh, again, it's hard, right? And, and it would take a lot of, of uh, very in-depth uh, analysis and understanding of the local situations in all of these places, but it's not working what we're doing by and large. Um, it, I'm not one of these people who thinks it's all the West's fault. It, it's absolutely not. Uh, people launch coups because they want to launch coups. Uh, these, these men have taken power because they want power. Ultimately, it's their responsibility. 
but clearly we're not as effective as, as we want to be in promoting democracy and good governance. So, um, you know, we were, we were tasked to come up with some sort of practical recommendations, and I'm, I'm going to be trying to be a little provocative in my recommendations. So that would be my first one, like think more about uh, federalized systems, maybe, and how do we prop up local actors who already have some level of legitimacy with people, uh, with the locals, who ultimately will determine the fate of governments. Um, if, if a government is illegitimate with its own people, it will not survive. Thank you very much. So both you and Cameron actually agree on the fact that we haven't been um, doing our best or what we've been doing up until now hasn't really worked and that these situations are very, very complex. So let me actually turn to Vemba because um, we're talking about the international community, but at the regional and continental level, we have the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. We have the African Union, who've been very involved um, in the response to the coups. And so uh, over the past few months, we've had coups in, in Mali, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, a coup attempt in Guinea-Bissau. So, Vemba, what can we say about the current and future role, I should say, of both organizations in preventing coups from happening. Um, again, they've been very involved, very vocal. Uh, they've applied sanctions here and there. Uh, the EU has physically been uh, present in some of those countries to, uh, to mediate some of the uh, consequences of these coups. So we're all very curious about what the current status of their effectiveness um, is, and then maybe what their future role um, uh, will be in the in the region. Thank you very much, Kamisa, and uh, thank you uh, to USIP, Dr. Sani, for all the work you do and for hosting this event. I think the issue and the question about the AU, the African Union, and ECOWAS is actually very pertinent in the sense that I think both organizations have a lot of internal problems. And I'm not sure they're well equipped to handle these issues, in part because of things that they did themselves. The AU has not particularly upheld its charter when it comes to democracy and putting the aspirations of the African peoples ahead of the interests of the people in power. We need to admit that the AU primarily, it's a club of presidents, and those presidents often are not doing particularly a good job in meeting the aspirations of their own people. I've always had a soft spot for ECOWAS. I think ECOWAS was one of the few RECs, uh, regional economic uh, organization that actually worked. I know ECOWAS has a track record of challenging coups and other abuses of power by leaders. But that has fallen by the wayside in the last the last few years, or last several years, actually. So on one hand, we saw ECOWAS take a firm stand in the Gambia, for instance, when uh, Yaya Jame was trying to stick around. Uh, that leadership is no longer there. So we saw in places like there's this dichotomy that we see where they so focus on military coups as if this is like the ultimate aberration that can happen in that space when in fact, the many, there's a spectrum of aberrations that are happening in that space. One of them that gets a free pass all the time, it's constitutional coups. And constitutional coups, by this I mean a leader in power who seeks to manipulate the constitution so he can stay belong, longer than originally elected in four. We saw this in Cote d'Ivoire, we saw this in, in Guinea. And when that happens, it's actually an alarm. It should be a red flag. And I think the international community, in this case ECOWAS, should come as strongly on that than they will, as they come on um, as much as they do on military coups. So I think the ECOWAS particularly has become quite ineffective in the region. We see, of course, whether we agree with coups or not, that the last coups we have seen have been pretty popular. Uh, and that's a question that we need to look at closely. So the idea that just because it's a coup, we have to oppose it. Yeah, okay, fair. But a coup is a coup is a coup, whether it's constitutional or not. And I think countries like Nigeria, in the case of ECOWAS, need, in the case of ECOWAS, need to step, step up and play the role that they've played traditionally, 
which we know, taking the leadership in the sub-region. The AU, in my view, in my humble opinion, has become problematic. The AU, while they have commissions that are trying to do impressive work like peace and stability and so on, but when it comes to really serving the aspirations of the African peoples, the AU has failed. So the military coups, military officers, while military coups are not the solution to the problems, I think it's time we should consider them just as an expression of public discontent, as they have the expression of public discontent. So my recommendation in this case will be to go back to the drawing board for, especially for ECOWA, since we're talking about Sahel, and starting holding government accountable as per their charter. African people are not duped. We can call it whatever we want. They know that their needs are not being met. So that, I think, is the context that we need to keep in mind as we, we look at this. Back to you. Thank you, Vemba. So are you saying that both the ECOWAS and the AU have lost some sort of legitimacy in, in the region? That they're not, they're not being perceived as, as credible organizations anymore, like they, at least the ECOWAS used to back in the early 2000s. Absolutely. I think both organizations do not have credibility in the eyes of the populations. Uh, and we saw this with the sanctions on Mali. Right after it happened in Mali, we saw protests in the street. In uh, Senegal and neighboring countries, it was very counterproductive. Senegal is the largest trading partner to Mali. So when you do a sanction, you are not just punishing the transitional government in Mali, as they call themselves, but you literally stifling trade between on, on both sides of the border. Just one example. So what is the purpose of that? And then the reality of a military government comes to power and we say you need to step down, you need to organize election within six months, within a year. Is that credible in the sense that a country like Mali faced a lot of problems, whether the military took over or not? It's not clear when the election would have been organized in any meaningful way. So how do we engage that group of officers in a way that is really practical? That they want to stay longer, obviously, is not acceptable. But is 13, week, 13 months, one year, is that enough? Those are also questions that I think do not really face the reality or reflect the reality on the ground. Thank you very much, Vemba. Uh, um, Joe, let me let me uh, uh, ask you this. Um, so we're talking about the international community. We're talking about regional and continental organization in 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 Africa. Now I want to take a look at um, U.S. military assistance. Both Cameron and and Josh did say that something went wrong there. So where the U.S. has been a leading force is arguably in hard security and training and equipping militaries in the region. And in fact, three of the five successful coups we're discussing today were led by officers who had received training by U.S. forces. Sometimes I wonder if it's just an anecdote or if that's even relevant. But are there any lessons to learn from uh, how U.S. security assistance was prioritized in the Sahel. Um, thanks, Kamisa, and uh, let me echo my appreciation for being part of the panel today. Um, well, I would start by um, just uh, trying to be clear. You know, we're we need to be careful about not. Um, uh, confusing the fact that there are problems, that there have been problems in these Sahelian countries, um, whether it be corruption, uh, whether it be security, and the fact that then we are seeing these coups. Um, the one doesn't justify the other. And I think we need to just continue to remind ourselves, these coups are purely about opportunistic mid-level officers trying to seek power. They're not trying to advance democracy. They're not conducting reforms. They're not addressing the needs of the people. They're not uh, uh, doing anything uh, in terms of uh, innovations about addressing the security threats that these countries face. Um, it's, it's, it's a pure and simple power grab. And therefore, in terms of international response, uh, I think it's absolutely imperative that 
these uh, coup makers be um, condemned and isolated. So uh, I think uh, the international community has a, has a very essential role to play in not recognizing these, these coups. And I think it's important to remember these coups are all still in process. They haven't been consolidated. It's important to push back. It's important not to recognize. It's important not to give them legitimacy. They need that legitimacy in, in order to be sustained. And so it's, it's a very fluid situation still. We shouldn't look at these just as in the past tense. And these uh, coups, who, who leaders are all politically isolated, um, they're economically isolated. And it is important that international community supports ECOWAS in continuing that isolation so that they do hand over power to a transitional uh, civil authority um, so that we can move forward uh, towards elections and some sort of democratic process. Um, in terms of the question about uh, security cooperation, clearly um, the fact that we've had these mid-level officers seize power reflects a, a, a problem in the way these security institutions are operating. But I would uh, suggest that um, it isn't, you know, we need to be careful we don't generalize. This isn't the entire military in these countries that um, um, uh, have been dysfunctional. These are factions within the military, um, power-seeking factions that have uh, seized power. And so I think we want to focus on what broke down rather than uh, offering, you know, broad stroke criticisms of the entire military structures, which <clears throat> I believe, uh, you know, there have been very genuine and, uh, and uh, you know, constructive uh, steps forward in terms of building military professionalism and, and, uh, and effectiveness. Obviously, uh, they haven't been sufficient. But I think really what we're, we're looking at uh, with these coups is the problem of having elite forces that are operating outside the um, the standard command and control command and control structures um, that uh, were able to mobilize uh, a small group of uh, well armed and well organized um, colleagues to to seize power. Um, you know these came from the middle hierarchy of the command structure. These were not the generals. Uh, in, in the case of the Hellian governments in, in Sudan, it's a different situation. And therefore, um, I think, you know, one of the lessons is that um, we need to make sure that um, any of these special forces that are created to try to deal with the uh, insurgencies are part of uh, the ordinary army that they that they are um, responsive to the command and control. We've seen problems with these elite uh, factions in that they get disproportionate amount of resources, training, uh, arms, and so it creates uh, frictions within uh, the rest of the military uh, structures that are out there. Um, so I think better to be working and, and trying to strengthen the capacity and effectiveness of the entire military institutions and the command and control, control structures, rather than focusing so much on these elite forces. I would, there's a lot more to say. I would other, I guess the, the last point I'll throw in at this point is, it is imperative that we recognize the role that militaries play in, in democratic processes. And I think that has been overlooked, that unless the militaries are coming along and they support and recognize the importance of having civilian-led democratic leadership, um, they're always going to be a source of vulnerability to um, successful democracies. And so we need to um, redouble our efforts to um, strengthen the norms of civil-military relationships and the importance of uh, uh, controls and, and strictures on the huge responsibility given to militaries and, and the you know, bearing of arms in these societies, which are um, explicitly intended to defend citizens, citizens and defend constitutions. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done 
on strengthening those norms of democracies and the norms of civil to military relationships within uh, these military institutions. But I would say there's a lot there to build on. There's a lot of good work that has been done, and we want to recognize that and, and work with that. Thank you so much for this, um, Joe. So we're here to talk about um, or to, to make policy recommendations about how to counter coups, what are the strategies to counter coups. And in your remarks, you did say that the coup makers should be somehow isolated. So my question to you would be, do you think that sanctions, like the ones that the ECOWAS applied, are actually an effective measure uh, to counter coups? I do support the sanctions. Um, and yes, there are going to be costs, but these are costs that these coup makers have taken upon themselves and taken upon their, their countries. Um, you know, they are the ones who stepped forward and decided that they are going to be the sovereign representatives of their states. They do not have leg legitimacy. They do not have popularity. Sure, there were some peoples on the streets, but many more people oppose these regimes. And we have seen in Mali how the, the Asimi Goita and the, the coup uh, leaders there have been you know, sponsoring youth militias to attack opponents. We've seen opposition uh, politicians speaking out against the coup. Um, same thing in Burkina Faso. These guys did not win elections. They decided for themselves to take on those authorities. Um, and, and they're acting uh, in, in their interests. They're not acting on the interest of the general population. So yes, sanctions, uh, uh, cutting these guys off, uh, they should not have access to the sovereign accounts of these states. Um, uh, and, and it recognizes their, their vulnerability their fragility um, in, in trying to hold on to power. And um, I think that has been a miscalculation uh, on the part of ECOWAS and the international community to give them too much rope, to give them too much leeway, to expect that they're going to lead a transition. That is not their intention. And the longer we play this out, the, the more troublesome it's going to get. So yes, they need to be isolated. And the, the pressure point here should be they need to transition to some sort of civilian-led uh, interim government that's technocratic, that can host a, a genuine transition process that's leading to um, elections and a restoration of uh, civilian-led government. Thank you, Joe. Cameron, I see you nodding. Do you agree with what uh, Joe just said about sanctions being an important and maybe an, if, an effective measure to counter coups? Well, I think we have to um, we have to look at where those sanctions are coming from, and I do think that with respect to what Joe said, I think that sanctions that are coming from ECOWAS, coming from Africa, African peers, um, are are effective. I think that they send both an effective signal, um, and given the kind of uh, trade patterns that exist within the subregion, I think they can be very powerful, especially when you look at a, a landlocked country like, like Mali, uh, for example. Um, the region can play a, a, an important part in um, in putting pressure, economic pressure, on coup makers, but I think uh, you know from the, you know we're sitting in Washington, many of us, and so from the from the perspective of international sanctions, uh, I'm starting to question really the the, the value of beyond the signaling. Obviously, uh, a sanction from the EU or or from Washington sends a a, a, a signal of um, discontent. But at the end of the day, I think we what we haven't talked about is the sort of the changing geopolitics of the region and the fact that you now have uh, a much more important role that Russia is trying to play, China has been playing, um, and a host of kind of middle power countries from Turkey, Qatar, uh, the Emirates, the Saudis, across the region. And so I think that the power and effectiveness of international sanctions on coup makers is eroding, uh, both the more we use them, but also the, the more we see these kind of new entrants who are, in fact, I think, taking advantage of the fact and seeing an opportunity and an opening uh, where there are gaps between the U.S. and Western um, uh, governments and local governments, they're, they are uh, filling that vacuum and creating new relationships in a way that I think will continue to erode the 
the utility of, of some of the sanctions that we've been relying upon up till now. So I think we need to expand the toolkit uh, beyond just uh, just economic sanctions because there are ways around them now, and these countries are get, getting very, very good at, at, at avoiding the, the worst effects of them. Thank you. Josh, we need to expand the toolkit. That's what Cameron saw, said. I didn't. Any ideas about what tools we can we can come up with? Yeah, and and I'll just endorse what Cameron just said. I am more and more hesitant uh, about sanctions. I, I think they're totally appropriate in some situations, um, but I also think uh, people have baked these into their calculations now. They know sanctions will come, and they have a plan for avoiding them. Now that doesn't mean they've calculated correctly. Um, and there is, again, virtue to uh, demonstrating our discontent um, with, with what's going on. Um, and, and we don't do sectoral sanctions. We only do targeted sanctions. Uh, but even those can have, let's be honest, those can have a chilling effect on other types of economic activity in these countries, which hurt ordinary people. Again, sometimes that's appropriate, and sometimes that's what must be done. I would like us to be a little bit more cautious before we reach for that hammer. Now, as far as, as um, what other tools we have, yeah, I think there's there are some other ones. Um, I like visa bans, like travel bans. Um, that that really hurts, uh, you know, some of these these elite um, families and and um, you know who like to jet off. Especially if you can uh, coordinate this with our European friends and and others. Um, I, I you know everybody comes to Unga, right? Like the United States is under no obligation to allow people who come to Unga to wander the city or go beyond the limits of, of the perimeter of, of the UN. So if you really want to start putting the screws to these, these folks, you can say, look, you, you know, we can't stop you from coming to Unga, but you're only allowed within this very small perimeter. Um, some of these, these ruling elites, uh, they have family members, adults. I, I would only focus on adults. I would never uh, look at children or minors, but uh, they have adult children or other family members who are living large, um, off of the, uh, you know, oftentimes stolen, um, uh, you know, um, uh, stolen uh, money and, and other resources. Um, and you can, you can say, sorry, like we, you know, we have to revoke your visa. Um, you know, you might even, you know, be a, a 23 year old in college, but, um, I'm sorry, like, you know, you, you have to go, um, because you have to focus on the elites themselves because they don't care in many cases, what happens to their people. I, I'm going to just say it very, very openly here. Like, um, like, but like Joe is exactly right, I think, on, on the people who have seized power in these coups. It's about themselves and their power. Uh, but Josh, you, Josh, let me let me interrupt you. Sorry. Sure, sure. So, but the, the 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 people who who seize power are not are not elite. Sometimes they, they didn't even have passports before they actually seized the coup. So how how are the visa bans effective on them? Because they're not it's not even part of their lifestyle to just travel the world. Yeah, some it, it won't work for everyone, but some of them are elites. Um, some do go off to Dubai and and Doha all the time, or New York. Um, so uh, you you'd have to make it. Um, you know, obviously, it would only work for for those who who do like to travel about. Um, and I'm always, uh, you know, at, at, so there's. It, you know, there, there are financial tools. Again, I, I want us to be cautious about sh sanctions, but if we're going to go that route, we need to make them as pointed um, as possible and try to avoid those types of sanctions that have larger societal um, effects uh, and, and really home in on the perpetrators themselves. And we should be willing to go up to the top on some of it. You know, we've... I think of, uh, this wasn't a coup situation, but I think of South Sudan a lot where we put sanctions on a few sort of mid to like low upper level people, but we never, we never touched the people who were really driving the violence. Um, so I, I think sometimes we have to be willing to, to make that decision. 
Um, it's hard because again, a lot of these people have baked this into their calculations. They know this is coming and they've protected themselves in some ways. So the, I said at the very beginning, we need to have some humility about what we can accomplish. Um, but the U.S. Is, is, is not the decisive actor in many of these places anymore. Um, there are other countries with much greater influence than us, and we should coordinate with them as much as we can to try to have some sort of united effort. Um, but at the end of the day, we can, we can throw the kitchen sink at some people and they're not leaving. I, I think the situation in Sudan is a, is a really good example of this. Thank you, um, Josh. Vemba, let me, let me turn to you. So I've, I've seen on social media some um, local reactions to international responses to coups. Could be a French response to the coups in Guinea or Burkina or Mali, and then uh, the U.S. response or non-response. And some uh, citizens in some of those countries do think that coups are extremely local, that they should be dealt with at the national level, and that the international community should not even be involved. What, what do you say about that? I think this is the challenge, uh, Camisa, about how we handle these coups. I mean, we're here trying to find recommendations. It's really contextualized. Uh, every coup is very different. If uh, in the context of the Sahel today, the coups are happening within the context of heightened terrorism and violence. If you're a regular citizen and this is happening to you, it doesn't really matter what Paris, what Washington thinks, because if you can identify with the people in power, and especially we need to remember whether this is rhetoric, whether it's true, a lot of the military systems that uh, military leaders that have taken over in the Sahel have all pointed to the lack of support they get from the civilian leadership. We need to contextualize, to, to dismiss them and say they're all grabbing power for the sake of power. That may be the case, but it's a specific context that gives them cover for what they're doing. We cannot decouple those. It is impossible. Sanogo walked from the field to headquarters to do his coup because he had some grievances um, in, in Burkina Faso. So whether this is, again, just a question of public relations, but the population identifies with that to a certain level. So we cannot dismiss that. Therefore, the local element becomes very important. When we talk about stability, whose stability are we talking about? That remains not just a philosophical question, it's a real question. The farmers who cannot go to the field because there's terrorism, what do, how do they relate to this situation? Which is totally different from me sitting in Washington, D.C. So there's that element. But I also want to go back a little bit to the ex extending the, the toolkit. We mentioned earlier that our engagement, the international community engagement, has been primarily state focus or military focus. What I'd like to see more of, we just heard uh, a few weeks ago that the United States, for instance, had decided to become a full active member of the Sahel Alliance. I think the US has the clout and the gravitas and the coordination and the money capability to start asking for a, to carve a bigger space for civil society. Civil society is much more representative of the need of the people than the military, however we look at the military. And often, unfortunately, civil society is not at, around those tables. And when they are at the table, it's very minimal. I think that role needs to be expanded. And we also need to have a longer horizon. The notion that we can just put pressure on people, then the problem will go away, it's absurd. And we've seen this over the years. The other element, again, I'm going to focus on Mali because it's the bigger country in the region and what's happening there is a lot of impact. Mali, if we remember, used to be one of the leaders in democracy. And when they did what they did to be the leader in democracy, they barely got any support from the same countries that are making noise today. So we need to start increasing our democratic engagement. Here I'm speaking from the US perspective. Democracy is an important pillar of US foreign policy. Flint talk is all good for whatever set of reasons that it serves.
But I think the NDIs of the world, the IRI of the world, the NED of the world, they're doing tremendous work with really little means. I think we need to engage with civil society. And I think to me, and for me, that's an important toolkit that needs to be elevated. Other countries don't work in that space. Uh, France doesn't work in a democracy space. So for an African, when they look at France, they see the same thing they've been seeing for the last 50 years. That means military operations, military operations, military operations. Any African of a certain age can rattle at least half a dozen military operations. So what are they leading to? And so to me, that's just what I wanted to put out there. Uh, I think it's important that we handle those within their context. Thank you. So let me, so again, we're here to talk about recommendations and, you know, countering coups. But one of the uh, more complex questions that some of us have in mind is, how do you actually recover from a coup? Um, and on, on what terms? Who should the coup makers count on? Who should the international community work with? Remember, you talked about the uh, civil society. Um, but and this is a question to, to all of you. How, how do we move forward? Um, we've had many coups. And actually, uh, West Africa was coined a coup belt. I think it was maybe uh, in, the, in the 60s because the, the region was so prone to, to coups after uh, independence. And so, yeah, the big question is, how do we, how do we move forward from, from here? Um, the Atlantic Council Africa Center, we're talking here uh, to CSIS. We have the ACSS. We have the Heritage Foundation. How, how do we all work together? And how do we move forward? Maybe Joe. Um, thanks, Kamisa. Well, uh, I think the way we move forward depends on how we respond in the present. And um, to the extent that coups become an acceptable means of transition, then we're going to see more coups. So I think it's very important that we do take a hard line with these coup makers. Um, I do think I would reiterate, you know, they are politically very vulnerable. And this is where the role of regional international actors is important, because if they get that recognition, then they'll have the foundation, they'll be able to consolidate their, their coup and, and they'll stay in power. And once they're there, they have no intention of, of giving up that power. So we're going to be dealing with the dysfunctions that they bring for years to come. So I think it's imperative that we take a very strong uh, stance uh, against these uh, individuals um, and try to move uh, again to a civilian-led transitional authority um, that can then lead to elections. We should not be looking at the coup makers to be transitioning. That isn't their goal, and they haven't taken any steps in that direction. Um, in terms of other things that uh, we can be doing, I do think um, it's important to recognize and 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 uh, and, and 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 understand that these coups are happening in in fragile states, and you know with weak institutions and countries that haven't been on a democratic path for very long. And so it shouldn't be surprising that you know they're weak and they're vulnerable to different challenges, especially with the stresses we've talked about with, with COVID and with these um, uh, jihadist insurgencies that are out there. And so I think it is important that uh, we are, are more supportive of these, um, of these countries. And I think we need to be more strategic as I think some of the other panelists are, are also suggesting, you know, our engagement needs to be institutionally based. Um, it is that institutional resiliency, which is going to be the most important thing for coup proofing over the longer term. And uh, Mbemba mentioned civil society. I think that's really important. We're seeing the value of uh, active civil society in Sudan. Um, and maintaining that domestic pressure on the coup there. Um, I would focus on the justice sector, you know, that independence of the justice sector, 
is important when uh, either coup makers or incumbent regimes try to manipulate constitutions so they can stay in power longer. To the extent that you have a, a judiciary that can act independently, um, that's an important bulwark uh, against uh, those sorts of actions. I think we want to be investing more in uh, independent electoral commissions so that when votes are held, they're, uh, they're, they're valid. And uh, we've seen a deterioration in the independence of these electoral commissions, and therefore it's easier to manipulate the outcomes uh, of of uh, you know of these elections, um, I think we want to be focusing on the uh, you know on on, on legislatures, uh, which um, uh, have often failed to provide a um, a counterbalance to the uh, over empowered executive branches in many of these weak um, federal systems. Um, that is a, a, a means of getting popular representation into the democratic process. Um, and I would then also uh, highlight the importance of, of uh, protecting media. You know, media are the guardians of, uh, of debate and, and uh, opposition voices. You can't have accountability. You can't have uh, debates if you don't have uh, free freedom of expression, freedom of the press. And again, we've seen a deterioration in these freedoms in, in recent years. More needs to be done to back that up. And in, in many ways, the freedom of the press is the canary in the coal mine. And when you don't have that, then it makes it a lot easier to manipulate other parts of uh, these democratic processes. So what I'm saying is we need to invest across a, a, a whole series of democratic institutions, recognizing that this is a, a, a decade or two long process. Um, and to recognize that, you know, there has been progress in some places, um, but it has to be sustained. And, uh, and you know, we're starting at a weak and, and, and at, a, at a fragile place in many of these countries. So it's going to be um, uh, a sustained effort, but it's that resiliency that uh, will be important. You know, there will always be problems in any country, even in wealthy democracies today. There are economic problems, there are political problems, there are security problems. Those do not provide a justification for coups. And I think that's where we want to be getting at in Africa, that yes, there, there will be problems, even under democracies. That does not then excuse uh, militaries stepping in. And we can help buffer against that impulse when we strengthen this uh, plethora of uh, democratic institutions on the ground. Thank you, Joe. Cameron, how do you move forward? Um, well, listen, I think Joe has laid out a number of really good uh, recommendations and suggestions, and I would just, uh, you know, associate myself with all of those. I think, frankly, a lot of those are captured under some tools that we already have that we haven't been using. Uh, I think namely of the Global Fragility Act. I think, you know, there are a lot of um, what I would call uh, early warning indicators, right, of, of, of coup behavior. And we can identify those countries. The Freedom House does a great job of, of, of ranking uh, many of those indicators um, already. And so there's an actionable, you know, set of, of indicators that we can be looking at and trying to uh, either arrest the, the deterioration in those indicators or, uh, you know, turn them around through uh, various USG uh, initiatives. I think of also of, of, of USAID's uh, Office of Transition Initiatives, right, which we're using right now in a place like Sudan. Um, but I think we also have to get better at engaging at the, the sort of uh, local level, the sort of non-elite level, um, and I and I frankly I'm, I'm, I struggle with how to do that. Bemba mentioned the IRIs, the IFSs, the NDIs, the NEDs. I think those are uh, 
organizations that are doing incredible work at a, at a local level that need to be um, that need to be built up and sustained. But I look at a place like Sudan right now, which I've spent a lot of time on, uh, where you have, in fact, a very organized uh, counter coup protest movement um, that has uh, emerged and really been the backbone of the revolution for the past three years in Sudan. And still, I think we struggle with how to engage with that community of, of activists on the ground. I think our diplomats, uh, not just in Sudan, but across, across the board, are are not set up that we're not purpose built for engaging uh, with you know mass protest movements or uh, even with with kind of uh, broad based civil society and I think we need to be better our, our our diplomats need to be be better trained in in how to to do that and how we can kind of tap into that again I think Dr Sani mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, there's a certain irony here that uh, despite having all these coups, you know, the Afrobarometer polls all demonstrate that, you know, for 65 to 75 percent of respondents in the Sahel think that, you know, democracy is the best form of government. The sim similar percentages reject military rule and military coups. And if you just look at the sort of the demographics of the region, uh, this is not a problem that's that's going away. Those poll numbers are even higher for younger uh, people in these countries. And so given the fact that you have this enormous youth bulge that is going to continue to make these demands uh, for change, I think we have to be better uh, at understanding and tapping into and engaging with uh, not just the non-elites, but but the youth who are driving these these conversations. I think many, you know, internally in these countries, uh, many of the political parties, um, you know, they don't have youth wings anymore. They are not rejuvenating um, their thinking, right? I mean, you look at many of these countries. Um, where they, you know, you have these these communist trained, you know, octogenarians, uh, you know, you know, trying to trying to lead a political party based upon, you know, sort of 1960s thinking of of uh, you know of of economics and politics, really feeling very disconnected from, I think, the youth in those countries. And so we have to understand that there are generation generational shifts at play and how we can position ourselves uh, in engaging and understanding what is to come. Because again, I think this is, as Joe said, this is a, a 20 year plus transformation of trying to prevent these things from happening, but we have to be on the on the leading edge of, of the response. Thank you. So, um, um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that you said. And, uh, you know, before we go to, to q and I really wanted to ask one question that is an important one, w w human rights violations. W we don't necessarily talk about human rights violations a lot um, when coups happen and when exceptional measures are, are put in place. But how do we ensure that these are respected and, and not violated in this exceptional period, because that's a coup, a coup period is an exceptional period. Maybe Josh in two minutes. Um, sure, I can, I can probably do it in less than two minutes because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, I, I'm not sure I, I have any great ideas beyond some of what we've, we've already discussed here, because you're right. Um, human rights violations are inherent in these, uh, types of political upheavals. And it's, um, I think Sudan maybe is, is the best example of this right now, where we've really struggled to have any sort of meaningful influence over how the security services are responding to mass protests in that country. Um, obviously, we have, to, we have to condemn it when it happens. I think we have to document it very closely. Um, and uh, so we should be in, in really close contacts, uh, of course, with, with folks on the ground. Civil society has been a theme of this conversation, and, and I'll keep going on that theme, um, you know, because they often have, have some of the better information that you can get. Um, and then some of, perhaps one of the best things we can do is after the fact, honestly, um, we want to prevent it, but it, it happens. And so it, it is important how we respond to it after the fact in the sense of, are there accountability measures? 
that uh, we can support. So is there um, a, a truth and reconciliation process uh, that we can support or something along those lines? Um, there's no satisfying answer here. At least I don't have a satisfying answer, uh, even for myself. Um, uh, because beyond, again, beyond what we've talked about with sanctions and other creative means and, and condemnation, it's it's very difficult. That's good. That's a good answer. I mean, sir, can I uh, add one thing? Please go ahead. To, go like, the, or to the mm -hmm. audience, uh, I agree with um, all the nuances and all the perspectives that my colleagues have shared. One thing that always stands out uh, for me it's when there is a coup, the international community always calls for a return to the constitutional order. And the question that comes next is which constitutional order? Uh, typically, this condition that leads to a coup, that means there's a broken order. That's why things are happening the way they're happening. So I just want to underscore the point that when country actually struggling towards democracy, towards good governance, that's the time the international community need really to buttress them with all the support they need. Uh, the problem is during that time, again, to stay with Mali, we had the transition from in 1990 with Atete and others. Mali did not get the full support of the international community at that time. So the problem that existed before continued to exist throughout and gotten even worse as time went by. So the international community, whatever that is, the donor countries, in this case, the Sahel Alliance and others, really have to invest in that space not to wait, because we put so much burden on these countries that are transitioning to democracy, expecting them to behave like Norway, when in fact they need all the support that they need, the way we gave uh, Eastern European countries that were transitioning. No country in Africa received that level of support. And I think if we want to see less schools, that's an element that we need to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bamba. On these words of uh, wisdom, we are going to turn to uh, some of the questions that have come from our audience. Um, first question here, what are the strategic concerns in the region and how does the West balance supporting democracies in Africa while working with others led by entrenched leaders? Who wants to take on this one? Well, Josh, you're smiling, so. <laughs> or Joe, Joe. Uh, yeah, oh. just to move this uh, forward, uh, um, I think what the question is getting at is um, um, a point alluded to earlier that you have uh, other external actors like Russia that is trying to opportunistically fill the uh, vacuum um, created. Uh, to um, expand its uh, regional influence. Um, and so what should uh, the U.S. and other international actors do? I would, uh, um, you know, I, I would say it is important to recognize that, you know, Russia is pursuing what I call an asymmetric strategy in Africa. It isn't investing a lot of resources. Um, but it is uh, um, pumping up disinformation in, in Mali, uh, in Burkina Faso, in Sudan, uh, to try and uh, uh, prop up its proxies there. And so by uh, co-opting these coup leaders, um, they are uh, trying to gain outsized influence given their minimal investments uh, in these countries. Um, similarly, with what they're doing with the Wagner uh, mercenaries, you know, they're they're sending them there not to provide security, but to help uh, protect uh, and sustain these coup actors. And so, in the process, displacing the French and Western influence, disparaging democratic norms, which is all part of the disinformation campaign. And so, I would say, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint. Um, we want to make sure Russia incurs cost for their destabilizing uh, actions. They should be uh, exposed and held accountable for this. I think it goes to all the more importance for why we need to um, support and incentivize democracy 
where we have to underscore why it's important to maintain constitutional order and have legal successions. Um, to the extent that we uh, support and tolerate any lawless seizure of power, we're going to see more of that. And that plays into the hands of the Russias of the world. You know, they cannot compete on a level playing field where uh, countries are operating according to the rule of law. They don't have a lot of investment or um, trade that they can offer Africa. And so they're trying these asymmetric means to try to expand their influence. So I think the US can, uh, can uh, assert its geostrategic interests by, by supporting democracy, supporting stronger institutions, and sustaining them over time uh, so that we have the long-term relationships that are going to be beneficial to our economic and security interest in Africa. Um, thank you, Joe. I am looking at a question for Josh. In context with a weak central state, how can foreign actors empower local actors without contributing to power fragmentation and local power grabs? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and uh, of course, it's challenging. Um, the You do need a framework that has a role for a central government, obviously, right? Um, there, and that central government is, uh, you know, plays a coordinating role, plays an organizing role. Um, and uh, within the structure, has a formal relationship with these these local entities. Um, there's going to be uh, there will be local power grabs in this scenario. Um, th that will happen, and of course, um, people will will try to elevate themselves uh, beyond what they should. The the concept behind devolution of power, though, is that the stakes aren't as high because we have power grabs at the central government level that um, are much more ferocious and much fiercer because the stakes are so much higher. You get control of an entire country if you get the central government and you get control of their treasury more to the point for a lot of, a lot of folks. Um, so by devolving power, you're not getting rid of any of these uh, actors who are going to, you know, who want to have an outsized role and outsized influence in, in um, you know, the, the power dynamics of the country, but uh, you're involving more people in decision making. Um, you are making it harder for any um, one actor or small group of actors to uh, wield um, uh, damaging power. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it, it'll it, it would really have to be based on organic. Um, legitimate entities like locally, right? Like you could try to set them up, um, but you really want to look uh, for, uh, like I say, entities that have some level of legitimacy already with with the, the local people. And you still want to do this in a democratic framework. Um, you want to make sure you have elections, even at the local level, of course. Um, uh, but I, and this is not the appropriate um, answer for all of these situations, but depending on some of these countries that are so fractured already, um, I, I think it's a more realistic approach for some of these countries. Thank you. Um, a question for um, from Vemba. Looking at Latin America, military coups occurred frequently in response to perceived failures of democratic democratic governments to effectively respond to national crisis. Are circumstances in Africa different? Uh, thank you for the question. Of course, every situation is different. No situation is alike. Even in, even in the Sahel, Burkina Faso is not Mali. Every situation is, uh, is different. I think I would like to reiterate, reiterate that the military as small as they can be in the country, they still represent an important segment of that society. 
So the grievances are just as important as the grievance of any other segment of the society. And in the case of Latin America and in the case of Africa, all coups are not created equals. The coups of the 70s were ideological. It was in the context of the Cold War. And they typically had no modicum of popularity. Um, the coups that we're seeing today are totally different, especially the coups that we're talking about in Burkina Faso. They're happening within a specific context. The heightened insecurity, the discontent of the military that is not getting support from the civilian leadership in addressing the causes or the, getting the support to, to prosecute the war. Terrorism is a very tricky situation. Even strong countries, rich countries, struggle with this. The U.S. struggled with terrorism, and it was not pretty. But it's not been pretty when we deal with terrorism. France, and so on. So to burden a developing nation in the Sahel with the cost of handling terrorism when institutions are weak, it's, very, it's, a, it's a tall order. So I'm not here to defend coups. But I'm just, I, I want to insist that context, context, context. And the history of Africa is replete with coups that went crazy and just took countries down. But there also have been moments um, of guys who came through coups and took the countries in different direction. Jerry Rawlings, brutal coup, and a few of them. But with, without Jerry Rawlings, there will not have been a transition to democracy, not at the point that. It's happened in Ghana. Uh, the much celebrated Thomas Sankara was from Burkina Faso. He came to a coup. So I just would like to say context, context, context. Again, I'm not here to defend coups, but I think as analysts, we need to take them within the context. Thank you, Bamba. Uh, let me look. Uh, Cameron, you have a question. Um, the U.S. State Department has special envoy offices for a handful of complex issues and regions, including for the Sahel, though that envoy post is not yet filled. Does this unique role offer operational or diplomatic advantages in a crisis situation? And are there lessons learned from the previous uh, envoy for the Sahel posting? Um, great. Well, I do think that there's a lot that can be said about how the U.S. government organizes itself um, around these issues, matters, and personnel is policy, as people say. Um, and so the fact that we don't have uh, someone filling the role of a special envoy to the Sahel, I think, um, is a gap in our policy, uh, that one that one that should be fixed. I think we should be, you know, we, we treat the Sahel as a region um, and we treat many of the problems as transnational problems in the Sahel. Um, and so I think we, we need to be structured in a way internally. Uh, if you look, it cuts across, uh, the Sahel region cuts across, uh, you know, the Horn of Africa, Central Africa, West Africa uh, in our bureaucratic structure. And so I think we, we need to have a kind of operational structure that, that allows for us, um, you know, to more effectively respond, but also I think to be a part of uh, the wider international community who is engaging on these issues. So when there are, um, you know, other special envoys that the UN, the EU, European partners, uh, the AU have designated, um, and there is a process, just as has, there has been a, a, a Great Lakes, you know, policy process for for decades now, um, and now there is an increasingly uh, visible Horn of Africa uh, process underway. I think we need to be at the table diplomatically with respect to to the Sahel, and I think that um, having a Sahel envoy um, deployed. Uh, as we did under the Trump administration, was in a really important um, signal. I think more importantly than just the diplomatic aspect, I go back to, you know, the sort of the security aspect. The security engagement that we have in these countries is very visible. 
Um, and I think our diplomacy needs to be just as visible. Um, and so if only to counterbalance uh, how we are perceived and how our values and interests are perceived uh, locally, it be, I think it makes a ton of sense um, to have that kind of diplomatic representation. And I think there are ways to do it within the State Department. I mean, I, you know, you can have a deputy assistant secretary who, 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 who carries the title of special envoy, right? So you don't have to have um, you know, an additional, you know, person in that role. Um, but, but having someone there who is identified publicly as, uh, as a point person on that policy, I think it elevates the policy internally. Um, and it also, I think, um, just sends a signal, I think, locally into international partners that the United States um, is engaged. Yep. Thanks so much. So a question for Joe. Joe, you rightly mentioned that the coup makers are a faction of the military. We may make a mistake by generalizing and putting all militaries in the same basket of potential coup makers. But do you think that the U.S. train and equip model is the appropriate model to address the factionalization of the army and strengthen the democratic norms you talked about? Oh, thanks for the question. Um, no. Uh, Simply, uh, training equip is not sufficient. Uh, you know, it 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 uh, misses completely the governance uh, and civil military relations uh, norm strengthening uh, values that are so central to an effective um, democratic uh, professional military. And I think it's the democratic professional military element that we need to be spending more time thinking about. Um, it, you know, just building up capabilities of militaries um, uh, may, uh, you know, in, in improve, improve their uh, lethal capacity, but if it isn't grounded in some uh, uh, democratic norms, some understanding that the role of a, a military is to protect the population, that it should be uh, citizen-centric and, and looking at citizen security, Unless those norms and values are in place, then that lethal capacity can be used against the civilians. And so um, I think we need to do a lot more uh, in thinking about um, uh, how to strengthen those norms and, and, and culture of military professionalism, accountability, respect for civilian rule. Um, you know, in the end, this is going to have to come from within the individual countries. Um, um, but uh, many military professionals in Africa, I know, really um, embrace those values, and it, uh, you know, it it is extremely disappointing to them to see these coups and the breakdown of uh, of, of the growth and and the um, inculcation of those values that we've seen over the years, and so. Um, it is something that needs to be done uh, in partnership with uh, host government uh, institutions. Um, it needs to be done with in partnership with civil society. You know, civil society has a very important role for oversight of the security sector. Uh, as I mentioned before, it, it has to do with the partnership with parliaments, uh, legislatures, who need to do more in terms of overseeing military budgets. Um, and uh, making sure that um, those norms are, are being inculcated uh, uh, within these institutions. But you can't just leave it to the executive branch. You just can't leave, leave it to the ministries of defense. Um, and for that matter, you know, it gets to the Ministry of Finance, too. What's the Ministry of Finance's role in overseeing how budgetary expenditures are being used and making sure they're for the right things? So... You know, training and equip is important, but it has to be built on a foundation of, you know, what is that training and equipping for? And I think it's that for, you know, what's the purpose of military, that fundamental question that we really need to be spending more time on and, and reorienting our efforts uh, towards. Um, thank you, Joe. A question from Vemba. Thinking about a return to constitutional order, how many years does it take for a successful transition period? And are free and fair elections a priority in this point, at this point in time? 
Thank you, Kamisa, and thank uh, the member who asked the question. I, again, it's relative. I think it's relative. Um, I will continue hammering on the Mali example. Uh, Mali was a success story until it was no longer a success story. And it was a success story because Malians, including the military that had taken power in, I think, 1991, whatever year that was, there was enough pressure on them to stand down. They kept the word they would stand down in one year. And Mali went on forward as a democracy. Mali, when at the time you read the report of the State Department, there were no political prisoners in Mali. Human rights, you know, it was it was a good it was a good bill of rights that uh, good bill of health that Mali had. But Mali did not get the support that as a young democracy they deserve to get. And so the transition could not fall from the sky. In the international community just did not engage Mali. Mali never got any props, never got any applause for what it was doing. US presidents, other presidents rather go to other countries that were in the grip of dictators than to go to Mali. Not a single US president ever stopped in Mali during the, the glorious years of Mali as a, as a budding democracy. What message was the world sending? People rather stop in Kampala, in Kigali, and other places. Nobody gave Mali any love. So it takes a while to have democracy, but democracy doesn't just grow unto itself. Democracy is expensive, very expensive. All the institutions that Joe mentioned early, the court, uh, civil society organization, political parties, and others to help build those takes a lot of money. And a country like Mali is not going to get that money overnight. So to me, the transition should take as long as it needs, but with the support. Otherwise, there's no transition. It's a, we're going to revert to authoritarianism. Thank you, Bemba. Um, a question to all of you. Good one. We have mentioned democratic institutions, but we seem to forget the private sector. Do you see any role for the business sector in strengthening democratic norms, and how can the U.S. support? Josh? Uh, yes, uh, is my, <laughs> my uh, answer. Uh, absolutely. I think private sector is really important part of this. Um, there, there's very strong correlation um, uh, you know, between economic freedom and, and good governance. Um, and I think having a vibrant entrepreneurial private sector um, that, and obviously the U.S. private sector can help with this through investment and uh, trade and et cetera, um, is, is critical. Uh, both because it addresses some of these issues, such as a lack of jobs that, that fuel so much frustration on the continent, um, particularly among the youth, which, and we're all familiar with the, the youth explosion happening uh, there now. Uh, you know, they, they have to get their economies going, uh, some of these countries, or they are going to face severe societal unrest um, uh, for for the foreseeable future, I, I think. And obviously, I, you know, private sector is the only answer to that. Um, uh, and, and I think there is something about, uh, you know, people um, involving themselves in, uh, you know, business and in, in entrepreneurial activity and um, having some control over their, economic, their own economic fates that lends itself to uh, a more democratic um, uh, environment. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you can, and, and this is somewhat low hanging fruit for some of these countries, because you look at the regulatory environments in a lot of them and they're irrational and onerous and everything else. And, and if you could just uh, rationalize some of that and uh, some of those regulatory environments, you could make really significant gains um, not just economically, but again, as I say, I, I think um, in, in strengthening uh, the legitimacy of governments, in um, buttressing institutions that are important to, to good governance, um, there's a lot of positive knock-on effects. Thank you, Josh. So we're slowly uh, coming to the end of our uh, discussion. Exactly. And 
Can I just jump in for two minutes on that? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, I just sure. piggybacking on Josh. I think it's such an important question um, that does get often overlooked. Uh, and I would say, you know, we're, it's really ironic. Uh, we're in this period where there's this democratic recession in Africa, but it's a place where there are more, there's a larger middle class, there are more people in the middle class, more educated Africans than ever before. And so this huge paradox of, uh, you know, why um, uh, aren't there are more uh, domestic constituents and, and, and uh, uh, institutions that are pushing back for uh, these democratic norms. And so I think it's a really critical role that the private sector can play. These uh, middle-class professionals, entrepreneurs, they have a lot to lose if we see the return of coups and military governments because you know the whole concept of rule of law um, goes out the window. And with that, um, investment dries up, you know, uh, as the saying goes, capital is a coward. And if there's instability, if there's political instability, that international capital on which, you know, new uh, um, investment and, and, and production, it, it depends, won't be there. And so a lot is at stake for Africa's private sector um, that to see these coups reversed and a restoration of uh, rules-based um, government you know, that then ties into property rights, um, uh, access to credit, um, access to uh, um, uh, certifications um, that often are politicized um, in uh, unaccountable uh, governments. You know, unfortunately, um, the reality is uh, autocracies, uh, political autocracies turn into economic autocracies. And so um, we can expect to see the same things with these military governments. So. It's a really important um, issue uh, for right now when we're, we're looking at how you push back, um, but it's also an important issue for looking forward in terms of how you sustain uh, democratic governments and, and how do you tap into the synergies between a vibrant uh, private sector and a um, participatory, accountable democratic government. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. Thank you. Cameron, do, do you want to add anything? To the question no, of just to underline, I think, again, we have these U.S. government institutions already in place. I mean, we have the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is intended to reinforce countries that are on a democratic path, right, and to give them that kind of transformational uh, economic boost that, that they need to unlock their democratic potential and economic potential. Similarly, we have the, De the Development Finance Corporation, which is now, I think, you know, merged multiple organizations of the U.S. government to try to streamline our, our ability to focus private sector capital in places that um, that are deserving of it and that can benefit from it. But I think we just have to remember that, you know, at the end of the day, these companies that are going in there, they're not benevolent. They're, they're, they're going in there to, 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 to mine, uh, you know, to, to take things out of the earth or to, to sell products on the ground. And I do think that there's a, um, an indirect effect of having U.S. companies which have to ascribe to U.S. law on corruption and transparency, bringing those business ideals uh, to these countries. But we have to remember that there has to be, first and foremost, a, a, a welcoming environment for, for the private sector to be able to go in um, and to, to, to make those commitments. Thank you, Cameron. So um, to all of you, I think we, you all agreed on one thing. We need to expand our toolkit to be able to counter uh, coups in Sub-Saharan Africa. And some of the key points that um, I, I noted down, the first one is that the U.S. should carve a bigger space for civil society in the region. The ECOWAS and the EU should take a hard line with constitutional coups and should abide by their respective charters in order to regain the legitimacy that they once had in the region. The U.S. thing needs to rethink its uh, security approach in the region, train and equip doesn't uh, work anymore or is not sufficient. Um, Joe mentioned uh, the, a hard line that is needed with coup makers because they are politically vulnerable and sanctions are a way of, of taking a hard line. And uh, Cameron, you insisted on working with non-elite local level 
uh, authorities who actually or authorities or people who believe in in, in democracy, like uh, Afrobarometer confirmed. Any last words of free, of wisdom before we close in two minutes? Then I would just sorry. Go ahead, oh, Cameron. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just. I'll, I'll be briefer than 30 seconds. I was just going to say, I think our consistency across the board matters because, uh, you know, I'm struck by something that the Mali and your successor said, Mali and foreign minister said recently, which was, you know, France applauds coups when it's in their interest and it condemns coups when it's not in their interest. And I think that we have to be consistent about how we respond uh, to these coups because Africans see how we're responding and they see the hypocrisy in our policies when we engage in Chad because it serves our interests and we don't engage in Mali because we don't like the, the flavor of the coup there. And so I think we have to have uh, consistency in, in how and why and where we are responding and in the manner in which we're responding because we will be, we will be called out and lose credibility to the, to the people who we're trying to influence on the ground there. Thank you, Cameron. Then about 10 seconds. All right, Africans want democracy. They've been working on democracy for a long time. Coups happen in the process. We need to stick with them. They are the example. South Korea, which is a power now, was not a piece of cake in its day. They had coups. The US never relented on them. They stuck with them. I think the time has come for the international community, particularly the US, since I'm in the US, to support, to take, to pick a few countries and support them all the way through until they make it. It's not a two-year experiment. So we need to start putting our money where our principles are. Thank you so much. Josh, final words? Yeah, I would, I would just reiterate the importance of local actors. I think that's been a theme here. Uh, civil society, absolutely critical. Uh, building these institutions that are the protectors of democracy and that can uh, defend it against uh, things like coups. Um, this, that's a long hard. It, it's a long hard road, and uh, I agree, totally agree with them. But I think Joe made the same point. We need to stick with it. Uh, we need to have a much longer time horizon um, on on solving uh, some of these problems that we can't even solve anyways. We we need to again come alongside local actors who are who are fighting this fight. Thank you, Joe. Can you be as short as George? Yeah, uh, I'll be uh, very succinct. I think. You know, we, our, our strategy should be to link up with domestic actors, you know, so bring the combination of domestic pressure and international pressure. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, don't just try to work this through uh, elite level uh, formal structures. Um, I think in that way, we can most leverage uh, our influence and get these things back on track. Thank you so much to all of you for this very rich discussion and for providing uh, response options uh, to coups in the, in the Greater Sahel. I would like to also thank our audience for joining us. For those interested in following uh, USIP's work more closely after today, I encourage you to follow USIP on social media, sign up for our email newsletter, and tune in for more virtual events. Thank you and goodbye.